Welcome to episode five on physically modeled bowed strings and inharmonics. I want to say this is this is really a continuation of episode four. This is going to be very dependent on knowing the concepts that we talked about in episode four. So I do recommend watching that one if you haven't seen it and if you are pretty new to physical modeling. So if we look at our algorithm again, we have this noise burst that we've been using as the exciter to make our plucks. And it stands to reason that if a noise burst can make a pluck, then continuous noise should make us a bowing sound. Now I'm not going to spend as much time on the bowing, I hope, because I actually don't think that it works that well. And in trying to make it work well, you can fall down one of those rabbit holes I talked about, which I did during the first attempt at making this video, and it was going to be six hours long and useless. So let's just uh, give this a try and identify the problems that we would have to solve. So first of all, to make a continuous noise, I don't want to use this envelope anymore. So I'm going to remove that modulator. And instead, I'm going to modulate this volume with my pressure curve, which I don't have, so I have to load it up. Rename this pressure curve. Modulate the phase with MPE pressure, 99%. And we'll stick with the twist filtered noise and just modulate this channel. Leave the other noise muted. Now you might notice that this sounds utterly awful. And I think there's, there's two problems we have here. One is that the comb filter is letting too much of that noise through. And the second problem is that noise doesn't really sound either like breath or a bow. I'm going to focus on trying to get a bow sound right now, but all the same problems are going to apply to a breath sound. So let's just change up our noise a bit and see if we can get something better. Turn down this release a little. Now this sounds like there could be something like a bow string sound hiding behind all that noise. Let's look at one of our secret buttons here. This is the mode. We have a mode for each, a subtype for each kind of filter. Sometimes we have many different subtypes. Um, this one we can make it 100% wet. And if we do that, that, that should get rid of some more of the noise and give us more of our tone. It's still pretty crappy. But we do have this other filter here that we're not using. Uh, I have this I have this cut offset to the wrong place. It it hasn't mattered, but let's set it to the right place. Uh, if I double click, it'll just bring it to the centered frequency. But it is a good thing to know about these about this cutoff. If you edit the value with the right click, you can just type in a note name and it will set it to the right place. Let's set it to the key track root. That seems like it might be good. Still does not sound like a violin, though. So let's use our other filter. 
Let's also make it a comb filter. So we can just get ourselves more and more resonance and less and less of that hideous noise. And that actually is better. So I would suggest if you're going to play with this idea to use both comb filters. I'm going to change the shape of my pressure. I want this to be a little less aggressive. I'm going to shape it more like my velocity curve. Now, what I feel like I really want right now is a low pass filter. This is a tonal sound at this point, but it's still kind of shrieky. I'd like to get rid of some of those high frequencies. Unfortunately, I'm already using both my filters as combs. So what if I, what if I adjust the frequency of one of the comb filters? Let me set this one to C3. What if I set the second one to C3? Doesn't really make a difference. So I guess I got to go back to my noise and try to dull this a bit. Uh, this is sounding much better to me. This is sounding like something I might almost want to use. But there's still a problem. If we get up to these high notes... We can hear a lot of that low frequency noise poking through. One thing we could do, we do sort of have a third filter. We have this high pass. And this one's just always a high pass. And I think it's a utility for just removing nasty low frequencies like the one we were dealing with right now. If you're, if you're not listening on good speakers or headphones, you might not even hear this low frequency noise that I'm trying to get rid of. But trust me, it's there and it's terrible. Now I think I've lost some low end. So I'm going to drag this down. And I'm going to modulate it with a key track. But I can't. I guess you can't modulate the high pass filter. So the sound we have now, I think, is passable as a synthesized string. With some nastiness attached to it. So this is a, a passable synthesized string. I don't think you're going to mistake it for a real string. Let me show you the best solutions I've come up with for physically modeling a bowed string. First one is in the Linstrument MPE library. Under strings, it's bowed string.
now the trick to this one, I had a, I had a hunch that the reason the bowed string wasn't working out was because the noise I was using was just not a good simulation of the energy patterns that would be imparted by a bow. So the sound of a bow is chaotic and noisy, but it's not noise. It follows a pattern. I believe this is called a stick and slip pattern, where the rosin will catch the string and then the energy will build up and the rosin will release the string until it catches it again. So that's the stick and the slip. And that's how it imparts energy to the string. And last I checked, this was, I believe this was considered still an unsolved scientific problem how to properly model that behavior. So what I did for this was I used the wavetable again to load in a sample. And I just recorded myself bowing the edge of my desk. And it sounds pretty hideous. I used two samples. I used a bright and a dark sample. So the bright one sounded something like this. And that is high pass filtered. So, so I removed the nasty low frequencies from that one. And then I have the bow violin dark, which is the reverse. It's low pass filtered. So I removed the nasty high frequencies. And so I have those on oscillators one and two. And I use key tracking to mix between them a little bit. Both of these oscillators are also controlled by pressure. So in this way, I was able to use, I was able to use an authentic bow pattern of energy. And I also avoided some of the nastier frequencies because of this mixing. So I thought this worked pretty well. There is a problem with the wavetable, because as I mentioned before, it doesn't loop seamlessly. So your bowing would just stop if you got to the end of the wavetable. My solution to that was kind of inelegant. I just turned the sustain down on the amplifier and used a whole lot of decay, 32 seconds of decay. So what's happening is your bow is just going to get gradually quieter and quieter. And for most passages, this isn't going to be a big problem for you. But it is a problem if you're sustaining a note for a really long time. It will just get really, really quiet. So that was the best solution I came up with working strictly in Surge. But another thing you could do, one of our oscillator types is audio input. So if I wanted to be a little more complicated, what I could have done is mix my two bow loops into one stereo loop with the dark bow on the left and the bright bow on the right. And I could just loop that in a different track of my DAW and then use this audio input and select the left channel for oscillator one and the right channel for oscillator two. And I would have this pretty much the same thing except my loops would be seamless. And I could turn up the sustain and stop doing this decay trick. And that'll also be a fun thing to try in general for physical modeling. To use a sampled or constructed noise loop in a different track. 
That would let you bow your strings with the rain, or power your flute with the ocean, or your steampunk harpsichord could be plucked by an actual train engine. And you'll avoid the static sample problem we had with the impulse responses because you'll be sampling from a different part of the loop on every note. So that will be a fun thing to try. My second best result at a bowed string was this one, Thoughtform KPS string. And this one was kind of an accident. By the way, this one's working. I am using the filtered noise, and I am using an envelope on the filtered noise. It's modulated by envelope four, which looks like this. So really, this is actually a plucked sound, and that's why we're not hearing nasty noise come through. So how am I getting so much sustain? Well, I'm using this feedback. Now, as we talked about, the feedback in general is an essential component of physical modeling. I can't say much about this feedback here because I don't understand it well enough, and the manual was not really helpful telling me what I want to know. But this is a feedback. This is an unfiltered feedback of the entire voice. We have a diagram here of our oscillator going into our filter, shaper, the other filter, then the amplifier, and then the output. But then we have another, another path here that leads through the feedback back to the beginning. Now, what I want to be able to tell you about this, but I can't, is what is the delay time for this feedback? And I don't know. And there are warnings in the manual about be careful with this feedback because it could destroy your monitors or your ears or ruin your life. And another, another weird thing about this feedback is it actually goes silent sometimes. Like I just lost my sound there. I'm still playing the note, but it went away. So. That's uh, another consideration. And also, I can't play this sound as fast as I would like to. If I switch it to mono, it's got a lot of that sucking sound that we fought with in episode two on the cello. Almost accordion-like. And that's because this feedback, I think that's partly because this feedback takes time to build up. You need enough repeats of it before it really gets loud. So the feedback is not going to be a solution to all of your problems, but it might help you get a nice bow sound. Or rather, a nice string sound that is not overwhelmed by a nasty bow noise. All right, that's it for strings for today. And I think we're also done with our comb filter. Because I want to do something else. I want to do, I want to make some inharmonic sounds. I want to make some bells. And physical modeling is supposed to be able to do bells, right? Well, there's a problem with the comb. I've gone back to a, an earlier pluck sound. And I'm using a sample again as my exciter. 
And it's a pretty inharmonic sample. It has a bunch of different strings vibrating at different frequencies. So the beginning of the sound does sound a little bit bellish. But as we get into the decay, we're getting a fairly pure tone. And moreover, because I have the key tracking turned off, all of my inharmonic frequencies are staying the same no matter what note I'm playing. And the problem is with this comb filter. What it's doing is repeating our sound at a certain frequency. And what happens when you do that is any inharmonics or any noise is going to be quantized to that cutoff frequency. And what happens when you quantize inharmonics or noise is that they become harmonics. They become buzz or shriek, but they will always be in tune with the fundamental frequency. So essentially what's happening if I want to make bells is my comb filter is filtering out all the interesting frequencies that I want. So we can't use the comb filter for this. If we remember our extremely simple illustration of physical modeling synthesis. There's really nothing at this point that we can do to the exciter in order to cause these inharmonic frequencies. Now we have to work on the resonator. And unfortunately, Serge's filters are not really going to help us. There's one that's kind of interesting. That's this tripole. See what this one looks like. It's actually working better than I thought it was going to. That's pretty much our only option. All the others are going to be like this low pass, when we turn the resonance all the way up. It's basically just going to be a sine wave. And it's, it's vaguely bellish, I guess. It's not going to be very robust. This is pretty much always going to sound exactly like that. So we're kind of out of options as far as our filters go. But we do have our fantastic twist oscillator. And we have the modal resonator. And this one will, will give us bells in a physically modeled way. And in my opinion, they are the best bells that I've ever heard come from a synthesizer. So let's take a look at some of the things we can do here. All these twist oscillators, they all have these parameters down here, LPG response and LPG decay. LPG stands for low pass gate which is kind of a combination of a filter and an amplifier. And what they'll do is 
they'll give you a very nice pluck sound because the volume is going to be tightly tied to the brightness, which is going to give you a very nice sound, very natural sound. And you can get very nice decays with these. They also make excellent kick drums at very high resonance. These are all always disabled by default on all these oscillators, because what they're going to do is they're basically going to slap an envelope on it and turn a continuous noise into, into a sort of pluck. So if I enable these and I crank these values, I can remove any envelope that I have on this oscillator because the, the LPG is very handy and it will create that pluck for me. I do, however, want some volume control on this from velocity. One reason I wanted to look at this one is we have this exciter mix, which will allow us to hear whether these other parameters are affecting our exciter or our resonator. So if I turn this up all the way, I'm going to get some noise. If I turn the decay up and down, it's having no effect on the sound, so that's going to tell me that this is going to affect the resonator. Brightness. That's affecting the exciter. And the material is affecting the resonator. Just as an aside, this noise here is really nice. One of the more pleasant things that you can listen to in the noise department. So let's turn the exciter mix to the left and see what's going on here. I'm going to turn on this LPG. key tracking turned on. Okay, so we know now that our exciter is this really pleasant noise. What kind of resonator are we using here? Because it's not a comb filter. I couldn't find this explained in any documentation, so I looked at the code on GitHub. And I think what this is, is a bunch of bandpass filters. So we do have bandpass filters available to us in Surge, but we've got two of them. And according to the code, this one is using a maximum of 64. And as I go through these options here, um, pay attention to this display. It's pretty interesting. I'm going to slide this down and to the side. So we'll still have our controls, but I want to see the spectrum analyzer. Now this material control, what it's going to do is it's going to stretch the frequencies of the bandpass filters. So I think down here, they're all concentrated in a very tight area.
As I turn the material up, we should be able to see them stretching. Somewhere around here, I think we're having just our normal harmonic spectrum. I think our there's this sweet spot where our bandpass filters are all perfectly in tune. Take a moment here. I'm going to turn down this release. I'm just going to play a little bit. I think this makes a really nice fretless bass. Maybe we need just a touch of attack here. So next time I need a fretless bass, I'm definitely going to try this. But as we stretch our material further to the right, I think our marimbas are going to be in here somewhere. And we could we could probably make a lot of different marimba marimbas and marimba type things. And I think we can get like a lot of I think of them as more wood like sounds with the material more towards the left. So your wooden bells. I'm not sure how to categorize this stuff down here. It's like a spring reverb. Let's try turning up the brightness. So now we've got our brightness all the way up. Let's just gradually lift our material. There are some voice like or insectoid timbres around here.
Now we're getting closer to bells. Say I turn this decay time up. So I think what the decay time is, is the resonance of these bandpass filters. So how many times they're going to feed back. So not only are these the best bells that I've heard coming from a synthesizer, But I think there's a lot of variety you can get out of them just by playing with the material and the brightness parameters. That's even before you get into any filters or anything over here. Okay, now because I want to sit here and play with bells all day, I think I'm going to let you go. And hopefully in the future, we can approach physical modeling with a much better understanding of what's going on. And as we work with it more and get some practice, we can develop some intuitive understanding of a lot of these things and be able to find our way through and around these rabbit holes much more easily. I really hope this was helpful because I think this is a topic that needs a lot of help. So thank you for sticking with me through it. Thanks for watching.